Hey everyone, welcome to the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club YouTube studio. I'm Dave, Whiskey Zero Delta Delta Zulu. I'm a member of the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club, and I'm the producer of this YouTube channel. And today I have a special episode for you. One of our primary goals at Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club is to help new amateurs into the hobby. And one of the ways we had the opportunity to do that was by helping the local Boy Scouts with their Merit Badge University. We taught a two-day course on the radio fundamentals for their merit badge. This is day one of that course. If you're a Boy Scout looking to get your radio merit badge, or you're a club looking to help the Boy Scouts with their radio merit badge, you're in the right place. Stay tuned. I'm Dave, W8XAL. I am not affiliated with the Boy Scouts, but I've been an amateur radio operator for 13 years. And I'm a general class license holder. Uh, I'm Tony Kalmbach. Uh, I have been an amateur radio operator for five years now. I am a general class. Uh, I'm also a Boy Scout, an Eagle Scout, actually. Come on in. And My name is Darren Kalmbach. Uh, my call sign is uh, K60ZIE. I've uh, been involved in uh, radio, been licensed for about 15 years. I'm an extra class uh, am amateur radio operator. I already did myself. You did? Name uh, license. Steve Jackson, uh, KD0UJK, general license. I've been ham up off and on for the last 20 years. Um, and before that? Before that, I was in the Navy for 21 years. So he knows nothing about radio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm Dave, W0DDZ. I'm not in the uh, Boy Scouts here, but I am an amateur radio operator. I'm a member of the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club, and I'm a general class license holder. Okay, so what is radio? What do you guys think? Any answer is a good answer. Got one? Used around towns. Used around towns? What do you, what do, you do with radio? What do you do with the same <laughs> we do some of that too. <laughs> Were you using something like this? Maybe. You guys ever used one of these? These are uh, FRS radios. Real nice for uh, short, short distance communication. Probably know them as walkie talkies. Could do them on uh, campouts, scout camps, things like that. So, it's so real good for things like that. Um, anybody listen to uh, radio in the air, in their car? Your parents listen to radio stations. That's radio. I'm even... Now, how many of you guys are carrying a radio today? How many of you guys have one of these? Is that one? All right. These are radios. These are multiple radios. I think we counted there's five radios in these. Because you're talking to a cell tower, that's a radio. You're talking Bluetooth to a headset, that's a radio. You're talking Wi-Fi in your house, that's a radio. Um, NFC, near, near field communication, the, the tap and go stuff, that's a radio. Uh, GPS is a radio receiver. There's a lot of radio technology in these things. Are packed with radios. So, getting more to the uh, more scientific definition, uh, radio is electromagnetic waves. This is a wave. Everybody's probably seen one of these things in your science classes or something. Uh, carries information. Could be audio. Could be video. Could be digital. Anything that you want to send, you can send it across a radio. Uh, frequencies. What's the frequency of your radio, favorite radio station? Anybody? Pick one. 92.9. 92.9. 9. 
So that's 92.9 megahertz, which falls almost in the middle here. Radio goes all the way down to three kilohertz and all the way up to 300 gigahertz. The other key point is that it is non-ionizing radiation. What that means is that there's not enough power and frequency to alter the molecular structure of stuff, like your body, like your cells, like living organisms. Ionizing radiation is things like the UV off of the sun that gives you a sunburn, nuclear radiation from nuclear materials or from a nuclear bomb blast or residue from that, x-rays. Everybody's probably had an x-ray at one point or another in their lives. That is ionizing radiation. Your exposure to that is very, very limited so it doesn't cause damage. So, come on. So, brief history of radio here. Uh, earliest observed evidence of radio was in 1791 by Galvani. Uh, moving forward to experiments with radio by Thomas Edison in the late 1800s, uh, leading to Samuel Morse in 1836 patenting the wired telegraph. Think Wild West, telegrams, that sort of thing. It took about 60 years for wireless technology to take off with Marconi in 1896 with the wireless telegraph. Uh, patented, patent for wireless remote control in 1898 by Nikola Tesla. Moving forward, an application of radio in 1912 with the sinking of the Titanic. Uh, before it went down, it sent out the very first SOS distress signal. Uh, World War I, like many wars, produced advances in technology. In, in context of radio, we uh, see the introduction of the vacuum tube for amplification. Amplification uh, increases the amplitude of the radio waves, making them louder. Uh, broadcasting took off in the 1920s. Another war, World War II, brought more advances in navigation and radar. Radar being used, radio waves to locate uh, aircraft flying overhead. Uh, after World War II, TV took off. To the next slide. <clears throat> Most of radio can be brought, brought down to two different basic types. There's two-way communications and broadcast. Broadcast would be like AM, FM radio, TV, GPS, stuff like that. You are only receiving a signal, you are not interacting back with that signal. Two-way communications would be, I transmit something to Tony. Tony has a radio, Tony receives it, and transmits something back to me. We are having two-way communications. Broadcast is one way. I only transmit and he listens. I only transmit, he listens all the time, nonstop. Within two-way communications, there's hobby, and then there's commercial use. Hobby use is things like your walkie-talkies, your FRS, your CB radios, remote controls for like uh, RC cars, airplanes, drones, things like that. Uh, amateur radio falls into that. There's also low power broadcasting that is used uh, to send private, to privately transmit music or any audio or video uh, within your house like Bluetooth. It's a low power transmitter where you can just have a low power FM station. All broadcasts in the US must have a call sign this includes amateur radio transmissions, uh, and CB actually doesn't have a call sign, but all amateur broadcasts as well as actual broadcast stuff, uh, transmissions must have a call sign. It is used to uniquely identify a person or a radio station. So for example, I am W8XAL. W8XAL exists <coughs> in one place on the planet, and that's me. KD0WDX. Uh, is only him. 850 KOA broadcast out of Denver, right? 850 AM. KOA is only in use in one place on planet Earth. That's that transmitter, that radio station. On the broadcast side of things, big commercial stations, K generally means it's west of the Mississippi, W means east of the Mississippi. In the amateur world, it's a little different. Different countries have different letters. In America, we have K, W, N, and A. We have a number. 
then we have a suffix. So I have W8 XAL. The XAL in my call happens to be very meaningful. It's not meaningful on most other call signs. The 8 indicates that it was, in the, it was issued in the 8 region in the country, which is Ohio, Michigan, and West Virginia. Everyone else here has a zero call because Colorado is zero. There's other numbers, zero through nine, that are used throughout the country that just represents a different geographic area. So every transmission, amateur and broadcast, must identify with a call sign. The frequency that you have to, how often you have to say the call sign just depends. Here's some call signs you might be familiar with. You guys watch TV, Nine News, KUSA, DT, you've seen that somewhere. You know, channel six is, uh, or, or channel seven is KMGH, seven, ABC seven out of Denver. Those, these call signs are all TV stations that are located in this area. You notice they're all K's and they're all different. <coughs> Sometimes they have a meaning, like 25 is KDEN for Denver, KUSA for the United States of America. Some of them don't really have a meaning. The RMA is the Rocky Mountain PBS stations. These are radio call signs. These are different broadcast radio stations. You maybe listen to 600 AM or 560 AM or uh, look on there. I bet you can find a radio station you've, you've listened to before. Uh, 991, 92.5, 92.9 we mentioned, K KOLT is on there. So the uh, FCC issues all of these call signs. We'll get into that in a little while here. But, uh, Steve, why don't you cover the phonetic alphabet? Ah, phonetic alphabet. Yeah, loud communications uh, accurately using easily understood words. Goes back to 1927. Things like uh, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie for the letters A, B, and C. Okay, goes all the way up to Z for 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 Zulu. Okay, the rubber band. Okay, Charlie, Delta, Echo. These are the standard worldwide. Phonetics, okay. Uh, first published in 1956, universally adopted uh, 1965. A lot of this stuff originally came or was refined by the military way back when, because they started out using things like flags and so forth in the earlier days, and then they went into things like uh, uh, Morse code when that came along, and then by light doing the same thing, using this as a guideline for what they were sending in Morse code and so forth. So it's been around, it's been around for a while. Why do you guys think there is a phonetic alphabet? So everybody speaks the same type of language. So the, the, spe bad... the special thing about the, the phonetic alphabet is that it has been catered to 31 different uh, languages so that each each person across the world can easily speak these words and be understood by millions of other people. The purpose of this is because if I'm telling you a letter and I'm mumbling or in a different language or have an accent or we're over radio and there's static or noise happening. B, C, D, G, Z, they all sound very, very similar. So you might not be able to hear exactly what's said. How about when you're on the, so you hear your parents maybe on the phone, reading off a serial number or something to someone they're trying to get service from or something, they can't understand it. So these word letters or words for those letters. So I say Charlie and Delta, you know the difference between C and D at that point. Do we do this? Radio wave propagation, okay, this is how radio waves travel. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot about is things like line of sight. If you're transmitting from over here, your, virt your visual horizon only goes out so far. It's usually around 20, about 25 miles roughly in that area. Okay, but since we use radio, we do get some other uh, changes in that, okay? We get what we call bending in the atmosphere. Normally this happens most of the time during the daytime. 
And does anybody know the reason for that? Okay, it's the, it's the ionization from the sun. Okay, the, the, the radio waves, not the radio waves, but the gamma rays and the beta rays and so forth that come from the sun ionize our atmosphere, makes it, makes it like heavier, okay? And that allows radio signals to, to bend to a certain degree in the atmosphere and you can get out a lot further. Doesn't mean you can get to everywhere out further because this stuff will, will hop. It'll come down at one point and then it might go up again, I'll come yeah. down on another point. That, that's on the next slide. Is it on the next slide? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Two slides up. Go up to the next slide. There's also issues where radio waves don't go through things like mountains, buildings, walls, metal. So I don't know if you've ever been listening to a radio station and then driven into the mountains, driven up the Poudre Canyon, driven up I-70, just the radio station. Sometimes you hear it still, sometimes it's just gone. And that's because a mountain has blocked your electrical view of the transmitter. So you can see here we've got a transmitter and the wave waves going off. And then right here is our unobstructed wave front. And then it goes around this little edge. Well, if, you're, if this is the receiver, you might be receiving some weird garbled transmissions because it's refracting and bending around the object that is in the way and causing issues. Okay, here we go. This is what I was talking about a second ago. Your radio signal could go up, hit the ionosphere, come down, and go back up again and do another hop. But you see you're missing all these areas in between, right? So it'll jump. The only thing that you can be certain, depending on the frequency, is that stuff that is on the horizon or the radio horizon. The radio horizon can actually go a little bit further than the visual horizon, okay? But using the type of radios that we use, we can actually get places around the world during certain times of the day and or night depending on where you're at and so forth okay so it's just not talking here within on that 30 or 40 miles that we talk to around here we can go around the world uh, we were talking to a guy from uh, Portugal the other day a lot of people talk to people in Japan some down in the Caribbean Russia we can talk to them on radio Europe yeah Europe even Africa Okay. Ah, uh, Doc Ding. You guys ever been out driving around and uh, listening to the radio at night and you hear a radio station from a long ways away? That is an, is an example of ducting, where it's very, very specific conditions up in the atmosphere that allow a signal that would normally just run off into space get bent back and shot through this area of warm air and then it comes out could be thousands of miles away so you might I've actually been driving around Colorado and heard radio stations from Chicago before believe it or not you can actually get some of that ducting when you get some pretty good thunderstorms going on too. yep sometimes it'll really uh, foul up your radio signal but at other times it'll duck and you'll get a better reception for different areas from that um, so you'll, you will see that too. Sorry, uh, I'll take this one. Okay. Um, so local versus DX. What does DX mean? DX, as an abbreviation, it stands for distance. What kind of distance? It depends on the type of radio. If you're working with something about the caliber of these uh, walkie-talkies. Uh, local, a local contact could be between a couple houses. Uh, distance, a DX contact could be a couple blocks away because it's more effort for the radio. Now, if we use a larger radio with different frequencies and sometimes different powers, it can be a case where a local contact could be within the next town over and a distance station could be with something a country over or sometimes even around the world. It really just depends on what frequencies you're using and what kind of power you're putting out. So if you've been driving uh, north of Fort Collins and seen a whole bunch of red lights and... Have you seen the red lights in Fort Collins? 
field. Not the aliens. The not lights yes. on top of the antennas. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that that right there is a station called WWV. There's there's a substation there called WWVB. They fulfill roughly the same purpose. Uh, this and a similar station, WWVH, in Hawaii. They set out. And uh, Dave, could you switch to that? Uh, they send out a list of uh, frequencies here. So they have radios operating at what, 5 megahertz, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. This range of frequencies sent out from a specific point, you can tune into said frequencies, and depending on which ones you can hear and which ones you can't hear, you can more or less determine the propagation uh, in, in the current situation. For example, if I'm in Chicago and I can hear Honolulu, that means that the uh, on, that frequency. on that frequency, a contact is possible between Chicago and Hawaii. Um, for WWVB, they put out a signal of 60 kilohertz. Yes? Uh, yes. Um, what, what that is, is a control signal. See this atomic clock up here? That is control or, or signal by WWVB in four cons. And every time a clock in the United States region is controlled by this signal. Uh, there's others in Germany, Japan, Japan and China. Uh, there are in a total five of these stations uh, we talked about. So how many of you guys have atomic clocks in your house? <laughs> no. Someone's got one, huh? Yeah. Okay. That's controlled by this radio station out of, out of Fort Collins. There's only one of those stations in the continental U.S. And you happen to be living next door to it. Okay, so when, when a station like WWV is sending out these signals, do they stop at borders? Do they reach Canada and decide, well, I guess I don't have a passport, let's stop here. Does that happen? Didn't think so. <laughs> Radio waves keep on going. They don't, they don't recognize borders. Which is why it's important that countries cooperate with one another in order to coordinate these frequencies so that they don't interfere with one another. Uh, this is organized at the, the country level uh, within the United States. It's called the Federal Communications Commission. They organize uh, radio frequencies that are more likely to not reach as far and so they don't interfere with one another. You don't want your TV station to open your garage door. It's that sort of unintended clashing that the FCC aims to avoid. Uh, in the, the international region, we have International Telecommunications Union headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. They do a similar job, but between countries, so that one country's um, music stations don't interfere with another country's uh, military communications. Obviously, this would be a very uh, problematic dispute, which is settled with uh, coordination. So, if you've been in a science class before, you'll probably recognize the electromagnetic spectrum. It is a range of frequencies uh, increasing, wavelengths decreasing, along with the waveform there. We have different blocks that we split it up into. Uh, we're talking about, in this class, mainly the radio spectrum. That includes your TV, your radio, etc. Uh, further up along the spectrum is your microwave, which governs your wireless technologies such as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Furthermore, into infrared. You'll most likely be familiar with this from night vision goggles. Uh, furthermore, into visible light. We experience this on a daily basis. 
uh, ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun, giving you sunburns. That starts the ionizing radiation side of the spectrum. Uh, for the still into x-rays. In, in short bursts, they can take pictures of your bones, etc. But in long-term long exposure, it is very deadly. Uh, even more deadly are gamma rays. Even short-time exposure can kill you. Okay, guys. Down at the bottom, that should go back one. Down at the bottom in that spectrum, um, 50 hertz, 100 hertz, 200 hertz. What do you know about those? Let me find it. They, I think I know where you're going. Uh, they are in the audio range. So they're frequencies that you can hear with your ears. That's 400 hertz. Now that is cycling at 400 times a second. At 400. That? That's 4,000 hertz. So then, as we increase painfully oh, across the scale, um, higher and higher frequencies. 250 hertz. That's, can you hear that? Uh, here. Can you hear that? Now, as you increase along this scale here, it's higher and higher pitched until we can't hear it anymore. So human hearing goes up to about 25 to 30,000 hertz. So we were talking about the FCC and coordination before. This, this is the result. We have a spectrum from three kilohertz all the way down to 300 gigahertz. And each one of these little colored blocks represents a different user. These users are listed here. No, you can't read them, but they include stuff like TV, um, garage door openers, RC cars, amateur radio, uh, the special cell, phone, phone. cell phones. The special thing about amateur radio is that we have pieces of the spectrum dotted along at intermittent uh, intervals. So we have a variety of frequencies that we can play with. Uh, like we said, it takes different frequencies to reach different parts of the world and communicate. So if one frequency isn't working, we can use another. What's uh, three kilohertz used for, anybody know? Down in that range. You know how long of an antenna would take to transmit down in that range? Was it about two miles, three miles? Long wire? Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty long. It's actually used by the Navy for uh, backup emergency communications for submarines. Down in that range. Yep. So that's that's down in the low frequency range, uh, 30 to 300 kilohertz submarine communications because lower frequencies can pass more easily through water, which is where the submarines are. Uh, moving up to medium frequency, 300 to 3000 kilohertz. This is where we start getting stuff like medium frequency. Mm. AM broadcast. AM, AM broadcast. broadcast. Thank you. There we go. Should have on that. Um, moving more into the, the HF part of the spectrum, 3 to 30 megahertz. This is where uh, HF amateur radio exists. Uh, this is the, the long, longer range frequencies. Uh, very high frequency, uh, 30 to 300 megahertz. There's amateur radio bands in this part, as well as some TV stations. FM radio. FM radio as well. Uh, ultra high frequency, 300 to 3000 megahertz. Some more amateur radio bands, some more TV bands. Well, something to note here, amateur radio has permissions on every group on that page. Although there, there are more groups to these three. 
But we have permissions we all have permissions. across the three sets of bands. Unlike, unlike uh, aircraft band, for example, they're limited to 118 to 137 megahertz. You won't find them at 138, you won't find them at 140, you won't find them at 110. You'll find them between 118 and 137, unless they're traveling overseas or anything like that. But in the US, here, these are just US. Uh, so amateur radio is frequency agile. We can bounce around. 100, 118 is not working, let's try 156. Let's try 27. Let's try 900. You just keep trying around until we find one that works. So if you look here, uh, Marines, boats, anything on a boat, they're going to be in the 156 to 162. CB radios, you go over, go four-wheeling or off-roading, you have a CB radio in your car, that's right around 27 megahertz. There might be 19 channel, 20 channel, whatever it is. They're all just different frequencies right around 27 megahertz. Cordless phones operate in that range. Wi-Fi on your house, Wi-Fi is 2.4 and 5.8 gigs. Bluetooth's 2.4. The button you used to open the garage door of your house, that's anywhere from three to 400 megahertz. Each one's a little different. They're never gonna be right on the same exact frequency. Uh, RC toys could be on a couple of different frequencies. AM radios, this is your AM radio in your car that you receive talk radio on. That's 535 to 1700 kilohertz. FM radio is 87.5 to 108 megahertz. Broadcast TV is pretty much all in the 407 to 806 range right now. Really not much on 174 to 216, although there are stations, I think, still there. Very few of them. And public service, police, firefighters, EMT, stuff like that, park rangers, they're 155, and then they're in 7, 8, and 900 megahertz. But they're all locked to a certain band, a certain range, a certain set of frequencies. They, we can, as ham radio operators, we can bounce up and down. If 900 doesn't work, 220 might work. 220 doesn't work, 7 might work. You know, we can just move up and down, whereas a park ranger, if his 155 radio isn't working, tough. It just doesn't work. Some of, uh, back on what he's talking about, yeah. some of the more interesting things as far as what we can do is we can actually talk to the International Space Station. Okay. We can also bounce signals off of meteor showers if we're close enough and all kinds of different ways of doing things. There's ham radio satellites that we can use. Yeah. Bounce signals off the moon. Live. Nice when they get a base on the moon, so then we'll be able to talk to them. Um, and back on the public service, as Dave was saying, if their frequency doesn't work, it doesn't work. True story, uh, back in the High Park fire a few years back, one of the state patrolmen that was out blocking one of the roads in the fire area couldn't communicate to uh, City of Fort Collins. So a ham radio operator was sent out there. Did you sit with him? That was me. You? I think you did some of it because I know Jeff did some too. I replaced Jeff, yeah. But um, went out and sat on the side of the road with the cop because the ham radio was agile enough to get through when his car radio wouldn't. This worked on his radio and his big mean master police radio didn't work. This yeah. worked just fine, no problem. Well, especially in the mountains, okay? You got a lot of mountains, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes signals aren't going to go through those mountains. Sometimes the repeaters are in the wrong spot for them, okay? So they can't hit the repeater. We use a lot of repeaters here even for the ham stuff in this area. So, and we have a lot of repeaters. Uh, but it depends on things like that. You could block your signal or they just don't have enough power to reach what they need to reach. And sometimes something else won't work. And we can usually find something that'll work. Yep. Okay. Me? Yeah. I can do it. I'm up for it. Um, back on the first uh, slide, we said that radio is all about sending communications, whether it's audio, video, digital, whatever, from one place to another. How do we do that? Because a tone is just a tone. You heard me playing sound out of here. It was just one single tone. It wasn't actually communicating any information. Now, one type of Modulation, which is the way that we change that signal to send information, is amplitude modulation. So making it louder and quieter as it goes. This is how your AM radio works. AM on your radio stands for amplitude modulation. 
So this is simply a case of changing the amplitude of that signal to convey higher frequencies or lower frequencies. The next type is frequency modulation. You guys all listen to FM radio in your cars, right? This is what's coming through the air to that radio. Frequency modulation. So here, the height of it stays the same all the way across. But instead, they're changing, this could be a low frequency here, this is a slightly higher frequency. That tells the radio what kind of tone to produce, how to reproduce that person's voice or that song on the air. The third type of modulation in the way of, way of sending data, much better for digital communications on this one, where you've got your plain signal, it's not changing in frequency, but it changes in phase. So all of a sudden, rather than continuing up, it turns around and goes back down, and then continues itself. Here, flips again. The way this works is this could represent a zero, this could represent a one, back to a zero, or other representations. But it works really well for digital communication. A lot of remote control, drones, cars, planes, things like that, work with uh, phase modulation. What does zeros and ones mean? Anybody know? Why is that important? You guys all know digital, don't you? Come on, you guys are from the internet age. It's all abstracted now. Zero, yes. zero and ones are the same thing that's used in a computer. Yep. For for you know, what the for the data in the computer, <laughs> and it depends on the pattern of those zeros and ones to what to it make means. Make up the data. To make up to each bit of data. It so all means on and off. Yeah, on and off is what it really means. So when you describe a radio to somebody, there's two different real basic ways that you can do that. A block diagram and a schematic diagram. A block diagram is your overview of the radio. Let's do a quick block diagram of this, right? We have a belt clip. We have a battery. We have a radio. We have an antenna. That's a real basic block diagram. Just imagine each word is in a box antenna hooks into the radio, the battery plugs into the radio, the belt clip attaches to the battery. That's a very basic block diagram. A schematic diagram would be if you wanted to know how the radio works, if you wanted to know what exact components, what to the, down to the, every little piece comprise this radio, you need a schematic diagram. They're very low level, very detailed, and insanely complicated to look at. So for instance, you see in this power supply, there's coils, there's resistors, there's capacitors. In a block diagram, that would be a block that says power supply. In a schematic diagram, you would have to know what each tiny little piece is, all that little see, stuff. See all those interconnections between them, between the components, the chips, everything else. That's what a schematic diagram is going to give you. You, know, you could walk into a parts store and build that. Here's an example of a block diagram. Remember we talked about how it's really simple? Well, microphone. Well, the microphone is composed of a bunch of different components, right, that actually make a microphone. But for the sake of a block diagram, it's just a microphone. Then we have an amplifier. That picks up the, the little voltages from the microphone, makes them stronger, goes into a modulator. That modulator goes into the mixer. The mixer actually produces the RF signal. It goes out to an amplifier to an antenna. On the receive side, signal comes in from the antenna, it's amplified, goes into a mixer, it's decoded, it's demodulated, and it's brought to an amplifier, comes out of the speaker. You might hear somebody talking. These guys have been talking with nonstop all morning, of course, right now they're not saying anything. But when I key this transmitter down, it picks up out of the microphone, goes into a modulator, to a mixer, to an amplifier, to the antenna, and it talks to wherever it's going. So. A block diagram, and I think this is a very important thing that's on your, your sheet, a block diagram is very simple. A schematic diagram can make you have a headache and be very <laughs> overwhelmed. Let you go back for one second. You guys remember about uh, the way that you transmit information, that modulation, AM, FM, and PM? That's what these two blocks are doing here. One of them is encoding the information so that it can be sent out. One of them is decoding the information so that it can be received. 
Now, a lot of what we do involves some risk. There's hazards, there's things where we can get hurt. There's multiple ways that we can injure ourselves uh, in this hobby and in radio in general. Uh, one, there's three basic types of, of injuries that you can get in radio and things you need to be worried about from a safety perspective. Number one is electrical. You want to make sure your equipment is properly grounded. This includes towers, antennas. You want to make sure that your radios are properly grounded. Everything, that third outlet, that third prong, the bottom one on the power outlet, that's your grounding system. If that's not working right, you can get a pretty bad shock. Some shocks and some of the equipment we work with can kill you. Now, most of them don't. Most of the stuff in your house would hurt, but it won't actually injure you that bad. But when we work on high power RF applications, high power radio things, we have to be very careful of our, uh, our grounding. We also have to consider that power we were talking about. There's a difference between voltage and amperage. It's pretty complicated, we won't get into it. Voltage is, they're just two different measurements of two different things. They're a measurement of two different things. Amperage is what really can hurt you, but you have to have sufficient voltage. Don't worry about it. And lightning, we're putting large metal objects into the sky. Lightning likes to strike large metal objects in the sky. There's also physical dangers. I professionally climb trees. That's what I do for a living. I, I climb and trim trees. I also climb towers. I do work on towers. If I were to drop, say, uh, this, this dice, if I were to throw it at you as hard as I can, it might hurt a little bit, whatever. But if I were to drop this, this dice from a 100-foot tower and it were to hit you in the head, you're going to have one heck of a headache. So we have to always consider the physical risks of what we're doing. So if you are underneath somebody who's on a tower, what do you think you should probably be wearing? Everybody who's underneath them. Exactly, a helmet. In my professional life, I, I sent somebody to the hospital on accident last week. I knocked a tree branch out. I was moving around. I bumped a tree branch. It fell down, hit a guy in the head. He had to go to the hospital and get stitches. It's pretty serious stuff. You have to really pay attention when there's somebody above you. Whether it's radios or any time, you should always be aware of things that could fall and hit you. Um, and and don't, don't climb a metal tower on a cloudy day. <laughs> don't, you, really, you shouldn't be climbing on a tower unless you know what you're doing. I do it professionally. I have received extensive training. I know what I'm doing. There's lots of safety equipment involved in, in what we do. Um, the guy on the tower, I would be wearing a helmet. That's just a habit for me. But uh, anyway, we also have to worry about the tools. If I were to drop a tool and hurt somebody, we could injure ourselves with the tools. If you've ever, you know, been hammering something and you miss and smack the can, you can hurt yourself. And uh, towers are really the biggest hazard that we need to worry about. And then the final hazard is radiation. Now, we talked about how uh, radio waves are non ionizing, which means they don't alter the molecular structure of an object but they can still damage it. Have has anybody ever microwaved some food but left it in a little too long and you kind of cooked the heck out of it, burned it? You can burn stuff in the microwave. Well, that's a radio transmission that's very focused. It's a very powerful radio transmission. It's actually the same frequency as your Wi-Fi, it's your Bluetooth. It's just your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is like one watt and your microwave's like a thousand watts. It's concentrated in one little box. So. We can be injured by the radio waves. It will start to heat up parts of your body. It will start to microwave you. So it's something to be aware of. When you see those signs that say high RF environment or danger or warning, they put those up there so you know that you're getting yourself into some risk. When I climb on a tower, I make sure I know what every antenna on that tower does, how often it's on, how much power is it running, what frequency is it on, is it turned off. The last time I climbed a tower, they shut down the radio station because it was like a five kilowatt, like 5,000 watt transmitter that was gonna be right on my, right at my head. Pretty bad for my body, I could get injured. It wouldn't, you wouldn't notice it for 20 years, but you know, you get weird stuff going on in your body from being up there. So it's something to always be aware of. The radiation hazards in this, in this industry are, they can be substantial if you're not paying attention. There's lots of jobs to be had in the radio world. Tony, why don't you talk about that? I'll talk about that. Um, so we talked about music stations. That's where a lot of the jobs that you you are familiar with, DJs, newscasters, sportscasters, weather folk, traffic, talk shows, etc. 
There's also the people that run those radio stations behind the scenes. And then there's the mechanics that really work on the physical radios that uh, perform maintenance, that design the radios, that make the radios, that sell the radios. All of those are jobs related to radio. They're all cool in their own ways. What other jobs out there? Anything you can think of. What did he used to do? Navy. Navy? You think the Navy uses radios? Yeah. More radios than we can stick <laughs> That's a job there. All through the military, there's radios. But you know, some of these radios used to be about this big. Yep. Probably weighed 200 pounds. You take one of those radios, like an R390, which is a very old radio, put it on this table, that table's going to buckle that heavy. Because it was all tube technology and everything. Okay, not like it is now with transistors and everything else. So, yeah. What about police and fire? There's dispatchers that are out there. What about NOAA, who does all the weather forecasting? They use radars to detect storms, and they use radio to send out warnings. What else can you guys think of? Mission Control at NASA. Oh, yeah. NASA. Yeah. Astronauts, spacecraft designers. There ain't no wire going to the there, ISS. There, there's no uh, no wire running up there. There is not a wire running out to the Voyager. Or, Voyager. Yeah, Voyager. That is out past Pluto now. Mm. All of that's done with radio frequency. Okay. So why has the FCC implemented amateur radio as an organization? So amateur radio is just a way to get a large amount of people knowledge. Know how to operate radios, know the science behind radios, so that in case of emergencies, you have a large pool of people who can communicate between different points. Additionally, because we have those separate pieces of the bands, we can experiment. Experimenting in amateur radio really drives the craft, the science, all that sort of stuff. It's technology, it's moving forwards, and uh, amateur radio is at the leading edge. So as an example of this, you guys hear about the uh, hurricane that wiped out Puerto Rico last summer. Basically scraped the island clean, no power, no electricity, no radio, or actually no it was radio. No phone, no internet, no water, no nothing. Within an hour of the storm passing, ham radio had communications to the island. And also, since they had, they also deployed 50 amateur radio operators to the island. Part of the uh, area, which is area, is uh, amateur radio emergency services. They deployed 50 people from the states to go out there and help them get on their feet again. Now, uh, uh, an event a little closer to home, do you remember the floods that happened in 2013? Um, they cut off the communications between Estes Park and the rest of the world, except for one thing, amateur radio. Amateur radio, again, within the hour, flip on the radio, and we had communications. Um, cool word of uh, thing here. At, at the age of 13, I manned the, the communication line between Estes Park and the rest of the world. So this sort of stuff is not Except out of the reach. sheriff's office yeah. and the emergency operations center with everybody else, every other emergency organization on the, in the area in that room, and he was talking to Estes Park. Yep. There's a little bit more to that story, like at one time they were talking about sending some of our people up there by helicopter, but then we found out that there were some ham ops already up there. Yeah. They weren't really an organized group at that time, but they since then have become a lot more organized. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, I mean, our people can go to a lot of different places, I mean, like that, a helicopter, taking them up yeah. there, because it was the only way to get there. The roads were washed out and everything. The thing is, this box here. How many of you guys have been to a summer camp? Have you guys done high adventure summer camps? Yeah. I did one uh, a few years back where we were in the backwoods of Montana on a canoe for a week. There was no communications. 
There was no two-way radio. There was no cell coverage. We were so far back there, there was no, uh, no weather radio. I took this case with me, which is the case for this radio here. I set it up three times in the backcountry and made contacts every day. Talking between Montana, I think you had some from Pennsylvania? Um, I talked to both coasts. Yeah. Coasts were coming in great. I had uh, California, Washington, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire. I think I talked to some guy in Maine. So, but nothing more than I carried in this. And that was enough to keep me going for a week. Okay. Uh, where are we at on time? It's like got 10 minutes. We got 10 minutes. All right, why don't we cut off here? Uh, and then we will keep all, all you guys in sync. Uh, if you did not notice, at the lower right hand corner of all the slides, this is a small number. That corresponds to the requirement number on your worksheet. So keep that in mind as you're going through working, at, uh, filling out those worksheets. <laughs> Just throw something at him. It's OK. That's what I do. Hey, at, least at least he's awake this time. Yeah. It wasn't so good the first session. Oh, it wasn't. Huh? <laughs> no, he was still waking up. <laughs> um, any questions about radio? Is there anything very you want to know? We, we have a lot of experience yeah. in this room. I mean, you got a lot of very different experience, too. Um, Steve mentioned talking to the space station. You can talk to the space station with these two items. This is really all that it takes. You can talk to the space station, you can talk to satellites, with nothing more than these. It's easier if you have a little more power, but it can be done. Um, this one is kind of an interesting radio. This is a data radio. So this one works in the two megahertz uh, band, and I can send internet about 20 miles with this. Two meg or two gig? Actually, I think you're right. I think it's two, it gig. Gig. two gig. So there's yeah, not I can there's send not enough internet. bandwidth in two meg. Long ways. <laughs> um, something that will come up a little later. This. This is a good example of a mobile radio. This is something you'd find in your car. Any questions? Guys, you can come up here and look at them. Could you call again? Oh. Oh, no. And I think after this is uh, lunch.